JM on Cars is kindly sponsored by Car Vertical, the only car history checking service you'll need, which references more than 20 databases globally to make sure you don't buy a car with a hidden past. For a special discount on the service, please use the link in the description down below. And now, today's feature presentation. Hello everybody, this video I have been trying to make for a very long time, but quite a few things have gotten in the way, so I'm hoping at long last this is going to be it. Over the last sort of month or two, there's been quite a bit going on in terms of my lineup. Cars have gone, cars have arrived, cars have moved around, all sorts has been happening. But there was actually a vehicle that was added to the fleet, as it were, about six months ago. And I haven't told more or less any of you about it until now. So, to fill you in on exactly what happened, just before Christmas at the end of last year, it was decided that we should try and get a car for my girlfriend, who is currently learning to drive. As you might imagine, not much that I owned was really suitable for her to do that. Her parents wanted to help her out, but they didn't really have too much that would be good either. They had the Toyota Avensis you might have seen on the channel, and that'll be part of the story in a, in a minute, but that car really was kind of on its last legs, and the only other thing they had was a sort of medium-sized 4x4, so that was out as well. We thought that it would be really good if we could get something that would make her excited about driving, something she would want to get out and about in, and that would really help encourage her into a car. She wants to learn to drive, it's not something I'm forcing her into, please believe me, but we just thought, you know, if you have a nice car, she's going she's gonna to want to enjoy it. Now, not, not anything mad or anything silly but we pulled together resources between a few of us between myself between her father her, her mother and we got a few thousand pounds together and they tasked me with finding her a car now this was sort of the beginning of december and the plan was for me to come and see her up in scotland i was living down in england she'd had to move away a few months before because she was caring for her elderly grandfather and because of everything going on we'd had to distance ourselves we, restrictions were being relaxed in the country and that meant that hopefully i was going to be able to come up for christmas surprise her and hand over her first ever car so i got given this budget and I started trying to find something in the classifieds. Now we knew that she really liked the idea of a convertible having been at MAS 2000 and stuff like that so I went to try and find something that would suit her needs and be, be sensible for a learner driver bearing in mind things that I haven't had to worry about for ages like insurance and all that jazz. I looked at MX-5s, MR2s, all sorts of stuff trying to find what would be the perfect car. I then found it but things all went rather wrong because then everything changed and all of a sudden it wasn't really very easy for me to be able to come up at Christmas anymore. So plans kind of got pushed around and I then did eventually come up because I had to be here on family business and I, I did deliver the car but I felt like it would be inappropriate at that time to really make any content with it. There was a lot going on family wise and because of restrictions here in the UK I just didn't really want to be filming while I was traveling. I wanted to come up here, get the basics done and go home. That was it. A couple of months later, unfortunately, a grandfather passed away. I then had to come up here again to help deal with some of the arrangements. And I tried to film an introduction for this car, but it just didn't work. So now things have gotten a little bit more relaxed once again. I am finally up in Scotland another time and I've been out today filming and I'm finally at long last introduced to you my girlfriend's first ever car. And here it is, a 2003 Porsche Boxster. Now, I know what you're all thinking, James, this is a silly car to have bought someone as their first ever. And yes, I can kind of see that, but please allow me to explain. So we were looking at convertibles. I had a budget of only a few thousand pounds that I didn't really want to go over by too much. In terms of MX-5s, that would really mean getting either a Mark 1 or a Mark 2. And all of those that I looked at were rusty as heck and not particularly safe cars. A Mark III, I couldn't really get a decent one within budget. I looked at convertible minis and those again all looked very suspect, could be rusty too. They might have dodgy pasts and honestly, they're little rattle boxes. I'm not really big fans of those. They're, they're lovely to drive, but to enjoy and, and you know do proper miles in, not the best thing. I looked even at an early Mercedes SLK because you could get those in manual and I know she wanted to have a manual because that's what she's learning in and um, 
I think she'd have killed me personally because they just didn't look that good. I even looked into a new Beetle convertible, not the new Beetle, you know, the new Beetle, you know the one I mean, not the new one, the new Beetle, the old one, but not the old one, the new Beetle, the middle one, the one with the flower pot in the middle. Um, and um, I don't think I could have had that on the driveway. I'll be honest. And those also apparently have quite a few issues of their own. I looked at an Audi TT, but again, couldn't really get one that I would have been happy with for the money. And you would have expected insurance to be the thing that really put pay to getting something like this. I really didn't think it would be possible. As it turns out, as a learner, most cars are actually quite cheap to insure. It's once you get your license and you might drive it on your own, you become a real risk. Well, as a learner, this car doesn't cost any more for her to insure than anything else. And when she gets her license, this is actually cheaper to insure than a Mark 1 MX-5. Now that might be because she is a lady and although insurance companies claim they don't judge people based on gender anymore, I'm, I don't believe them. And also not many young people buy a Porsche Boxster as their first car. So that means it's nice and decent. There was another part of the puzzle too, or several in fact. First off, the color. Green Lagoon, absolutely gorgeous. It originally had some gold lobster claws on it, which looked really good, but were massive, massive wheels that made the car ride a little bit too hard and they just looked a bit silly. So we've put these 17 inch uh, winter alloys on from a 987 came and these actually need to be replaced soon because it's not winter anymore. And it's got a gray leather interior, which actually looks quite nice and is in very good condition. Quite high mileage, which is how we were able to afford a late model 986, it's nearly 180,000 miles. But that's fine because she told me she didn't want her first car to be immaculate. And this car is far from that. Loads and loads and loads of stone chips on the front, loads of weird dents that I keep noticing on the, on the bonnet and on the rear arch. I don't know what's happened to this car. They're very odd marks in strange places, but there you go. Decent spec with heated seats. You've got an upgraded um, uh, sound system, which is actually quite nice. You've got lecky roof, lecky windows, that's standard, nice little visor at the back. So it's actually um, it's actually quite nice to drive with the roof down, very warm. It's got air con, the upgraded air con too, because that wasn't standard and all sorts of nice features. We even have quite a bit of the service history, including the original bill of sale. So we know what this car cost when it was new and it was not cheap, but the real, big part of this to me was twofold. First off, I wanted to bring a car onto the channel that was very affordable, but also in a lot of ways quite desirable, something that people could look up to and, and really sort of want to have that actually wasn't expensive at all. And I needed something that I knew I could get worked on and I was familiar with. I've had 996s and things before, so I know roughly what these cars are like, what their weaknesses are. When it comes to something like an MX-5 or an SLK, I'm I'm a bit clueless. I'll be honest, mechanically I'm useless anyway, but in terms of those cars, I'm particularly lacking in the knowledge department. I did actually look at a uh, Mark III MR2, but those do also have their own issues and um, storage space, not exactly great. Because this is gonna be a daily driver, I wanted something with lots of room in it, and this has plenty of that. Now, I'll be playing over this introduction, a lot of pictures of the car, which have been taken at various points in time, and you'll get an idea of it. I think it's quite a nice thing as a, a first car, but the real key for me was being able to have people, both where we live down south and up here in Scotland, who can look after it. And I've been extremely grateful to our friends, George and Caitlin, who run the Region 2 Scotland North of the Porsche Club of Great Britain. They are the youngest regional organizers in Porsche Club history and very friendly people, a pair of engineering students or former engineering students, they've got their degrees now, and they've been slowly over the last couple of months working on this car, which has been christened Elvira, specifically Elvira Le Chonc. I didn't really want to tell you what it was called, but also I know that I wouldn't be forgiven if I didn't. So in order to talk you through a little bit more about what this car is, what's been done to it, and what we still have to do to it, because you may be shocked to know, but a dirt cheap Boxster is not a car without problems, I'm going to hand you over to George from the Porsche Club, who's been looking after it for us and has been absolutely invaluable and very helpful with the whole project. So yeah, this is James and Esther's 986 Boxster. As James has said, this is a late model car registered on a 53 plate, but I think it might be a January 04 build. And because it's one of the late ones, not an S, it's one of the 2.7s, which is a great engine in these cars. Seems to be a lot more bulletproof than some of the other engines that were available with. 
and I guess that's the reason why this car has been able to soldier on to 177,000 miles as it reads on the clock just now, which is a great achievement and it feels like it's got plenty more miles in it. The engine still feels really tight, really sweet and just a testament to how good these water-cooled cars are. They really are a bargain. So, as James has said, there has been quite a lot of work on this car. I think adding it all up, bearing in mind we are amateur mechanics, it's probably been about 50 to 60 hours work on it. Some of the key jobs that are done on the car, uh, first of all, the headlights, all 996s, 986s, they suffer from clouding on the headlights at this age. So the headlights came out, uh, we machine polished those, uh, sandpapered them first, then polished. There was also uh, the mechanism in one of the headlights was broken as well, so we got that repaired for the self-leveling. Um, we also, as James has said, we changed the wheels over. These were a set of wheels that came off my 987 Cayman. They had some track tyres on them before, but they've now got these winters on them. Um, the cars obviously had a full clean and detail, um, not machine polish the paint. I think we're going to wait and get the, the bonnet painted first before we do that. Um, all the filters under the hoods. Uh, we've done the gas struts as well to stop the bonnet falling on your fingers. Um, we've also at the front done uh, anti-roll bars, um, both front and rear anti-roll bars, it's now got adjustable eye-back units on it, new drop links, new bushes, uh, new lower control arms at the front as well, they were quite a pig to get out, the old ones, but they made a big difference to the car, it feels a lot tighter now than it used to, still very compliant, I'm surprised for me with the 987 Cayman just how soft this car is set up, but it makes it a fantastic cruiser, it really is very comfortable. Uh, as James has said, the interior is really, really good on this car, so we've not actually had to do anything to the interior um, other than give it a good clean. And right in the back is kind of where most of the work has been done. So again, it got the full service at the back, so that was oil, all the oil, all the filters. It got a K&N air filter. Uh, the engine also had 177,000 miles worth of grease on it, so that all got cleaned up as well. Probably the hardest job on the car was the exhaust. Um, it had a, it was called a Toyo Sport exhaust on it. It had a nice sound, but it was far too loud. It droned terribly, especially at motorway speed. So that came out, and it was surprisingly easy to get that out. What was hard was getting the new exhaust back in. I think because the old one had come out with the bumper on, I didn't realise that you actually had to take the bumper off to put the exhaust on. We also had cut the old one off and we're putting the new one on when we realised that actually whoever had had the car before and put this sport exhaust on had binned half of the factory hanging mounts for it. So we had to go to Porsche and get the original factory hanging mounts to, to get the exhaust on this car and that was probably one of the bigger bills we, we've had on this car so far. But all done, bumpers back on, exhaust sounds great, looks really nice with the twin tailpipes, stainless steel as well, so it's nice and shiny and it'll last a long, long time. I mean, I, the exhaust that was on the car, all the uh, manifolds, the intermediate pipes, the catalytic converters, they are all original to the car. Absolutely amazing that the car has managed its whole life without changing any of these components. And that's pretty much the main things. Lots of other little sundries, just tidying up little bits and pieces. We've still got a little bit of work to do on the roof. One of the little cables, the tensioner cables, doesn't quite fall into the right channel. Uh, we also need to have another look at the windscreen washers. They're not working 100%. The um, little pipe is split somewhere, so the, the fluid just leaks out from the bottom. And it needs a good alignment setup, as you can imagine, with all that suspension work. It's just a little bit vague at the moment. And when we get the winters off it, that'll help as well. All in, it's really been a very enjoyable pro project for us. Um, I think the parts spend is probably in the region of about £3,000. So although it's kind of a lot of money for a car like this, it's now a really well sorted car, even though it's, yeah, the paint isn't great and it's got big miles on it. This car will now soldier on for quite a few years without any more major issues. That's the plan. So that's quite an information dump I appreciate. I was really hoping that this would be sort of several videos worth of content, but I just wanted to sort of introduce the car to you all and bring you Morris up to speed with where it is. So as George said, there's still a few items to do, but largely a lot of what we've done has been mostly general maintenance. The things that have been unusual are say the exhaust because not only was the Toyo Sport incredibly droney, I mean, I drove all the way from South England up to Scotland 
Scotland and it was not a pleasant experience. At 70 mile an hour, this car was horrible. Because of insurance reasons, we also had to return the car where we could to either OE or OE spec as well. So as much as I would have loved to have put a nice fruity exhaust on the back, it had to be one that was more or less OE equivalent. So it's a shame, but hey ho, in a few years, we may change it. And the intention is to keep this car around for quite a while because although it now owes us about sort of six or 7,000 pounds all in, it's a lot of car for that money. Eventually I will get the cosmetic side sorted, but Esther was very specific about having a car that was cosmetically imperfect. And this is certainly that, but there's also a heck of a lot to like about it. And I would really like to know from all of you what kind of content you want to see made on this car. Do you want to know more about what it's like to learn to drive in one of these? Because obviously I've now got a little bit of driving experience, but she doesn't. So I'm sure I can get some reports from her as to how she feels it, it is to drive. And there are a few other cars she's going to be driving too, so she can compare and contrast. Do you want to know what the cost of things are? Do you want to know how this car is in relation to, say, the S2000 or other equivalently priced sports cars, MX-5s, MR2s, that sort of stuff? Please do let me know. But I've been so keen, it's been so important to me to get this car on the channel because I am always conscious of the fact that with my fleet now becoming a little bit more exotic and expensive, I don't want anybody to think that I've kind of forgotten the joy of simple basic motoring. And it's actually been terrible for me not having this car on the driveway because I really love driving it. I was inspired to, to get one of these after I drove a base 2.5 Boxster as part of the videos that were organized by George and Caitlin last year. And I, I had a go in the car and I just thought, I'd previously written off the plain old Boxster. I didn't really think it was a, a car ever worth my time. But then I drove one and I thought, you know, I don't care that it doesn't even have that much power. Honestly, I didn't pick this because the engine I picked it because of the color. That's what just stood out to me. I just knew it was a car that the other half would have loved. And luckily she does. And I say luckily because um, not only did she not know that I'd bought this, but her parents didn't actually know what I'd spent their money on. Um, and um, they're not really car people. So I was very worried <laughs> when I turned up at Christmas, having spent all of their money on a Porsche that I would be crucified. Luckily, they really do love it. In fact, I think they want their own Porsche now and they're really gonna miss it when it goes home. But that's an introduction of Elvira to you all. Thanks for watching. A huge, massive thank you to George and Caitlin for helping us with this endeavor because it would have been simply impossible without them. And if you are in Scotland North or indeed anywhere in the country and you have a Porsche and you want to know a little bit more about your car or you're thinking of buying one, do join up with the Porsche Club because I've got George standing behind the camera and I'm sure he's nodding away going, yes, yes, this is what you're meant to do. If you buy a Porsche, you join the Porsche Club. We've got the Porsche Club stickers in there. I'm normally not one for joining car clubs, but they've been so helpful, I couldn't not. So another big thank you to them. Thank you to you. And I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.